Hello everyone and thanks for coming back to the channel. Hopefully the thumbnail is clear. This is phase one or the build process for what is essentially our new line of micros. Uh, this particular one is the mode two splinter. And you'll find that I have different props on now than what I show you later on in the video. I thought this was a three inch operator. Turns out not so much. If you use three inch props, you get a little overlap as you can see in that picture. So I switched them out. I had some HQ props, which fit nightly with the uh, color motif. This isn't a blow by blow build video. This is kind of a general premise. I do a few things off camera, namely all the little soldering. We do a little bit of soldering on camera. Um, and I do use an all-in-one camera and VTX, but I also get out a build that's basically got a separate camera and VTX and kind of show you that. Of course, because this is just a premise, your solder pads may be in slightly different locations depending upon which board you choose to use or which components you choose to use. But the general gist of this should make sense. We also walk through BL Heli and we do the beta flight setup as well. Enjoy! Let's get started on this build. I've already kind of done some of the preliminary stuff that I don't think you need to watch. Uh, one is I cut my motor wires to length. We're going down to these pads. I haven't tinned this particular pad, so I'll do that here if you're wanting to see. Uh, some of you want to see me do some soldering on this. But this is the, the Beta FPV all-in-one flight controller. It's the 12-amp version. I really like this board, even with the connectors, because that gives you the versatility, versatility of being able to plug connectors in if you've got motors with those, or be able to solder these pads. Those pads are pretty decent size. So we should be able to handle that just fine. This is the Newbie Drone Canopy. I'll have links to all these parts down in the video description. This is a real good canopy, and especially when you're going like I am. I like a really Really wide field of view and I find that this is one of the better if not the best cameras on the market when you're going all in one it is only 25 milliwatts some people don't care for that uh, but it fits nicely inside this uh, mount and it stays pretty well protected you can see the mounts got a little grabber here for the antenna tube uh, once I've got that all connected it will go in there and then when I get to mounting this on top I'll have a real low profile I've got a little bit of a longer screw in front so in case I wanted to increase the camera angle I can do that a few things about what I've done already I have mounted a rubber band on the bottom I did fail to put my battery pad so I'm gonna have to wiggle a battery pad underneath there with the mode 2 you can see that you can do uh, a traditional battery strap if you do run a battery strap, I would highly suggest getting the Pyroflip, the white battery strap that they have. It's a nice battery strap. I've become a big fan of it in a short period of time. This is the battery strap I would suggest. I'm using a rubber band in this case. This will add about a gram, maybe a gram and a half to your build. Uh, so we've got this camera. This is able to be controlled via smart audio. I'll wire that to the board. And then I've got my receiver out and I've already pre-cut that. Now back to the motors. I kind of skipped over this doing an overview of where I'm at in the moment. But how I trim motors, if that's a detail you'd like to see, is I go ahead and I hold these down and I just kind of push things over and I do an estimate on my cut. You can see that all my wires would be able to reach the furthest pad. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with having a little extra wire because I plan to use tape right down here and the wires will stay out of harm's way. I've also got my receiver out. Make sure I've got the board oriented right. Uh, this is the back here. My receiver is going to connect right up here. Hopefully you can see this. Let me hold this up closer so you can get a good read on this board. No, I can't hardly see it. So we've got S-Bus, which is this top 10 pad. We've got a 5 volt and a ground. And that's pretty much all I need with my Eversky XSR receiver here. And I've already cut these to length. I plan to position this somewhat like this right underneath uh, this canopy. And I'll just kind of wiggle these wires around down that way and I'll solder those up. If you're wanting to use a camera that's more like the Runcam Nano with a traditional VTX, this is what it looks like. <laughs> Look at this wiring mess. Uh, so this is actually an SSR, an RXSR that I took the connector off. So you can see we've got uh, the signal, which is S-Bus, 5 volt, and ground. This has actually been in the quad. We've got the Ishin Nano VTX without its antenna that goes right there. And we've got the Runcam Racer right here. And uh, so our run cam racer, I get power and ground off the Nano or the Ishin v Nano VTX. I like to power my cameras from the VTX whenever possible. And then I get power for the VTX right down here off of ground and, and uh, 5 volt. And then we've got from our VTX, this pad down here is our video out next to that where our camera is connected. Hopefully you following my little wiring here is the video in. And then we've got smart audio down here on TX1. 
which you go into beta flight and you set that up and we'll do all those things as soon as I have this one built. Okay, so hopefully we got the basics covered in our getting started here. Oh, I don't think I covered, uh, I've got nuts up here and in the back. This screw length I'm not worried about because this canopy is not going to be using the rear screw. I only need some screw length on these three positions. Of course, yours might vary. You also see that I have got a nut here at the bottom. Now, traditionally, I like to use a lock nut right there, and I like to get that good and tight to create vertical rigidity. In this case, I couldn't find my slim lot nylon lock nut, so I had to go with a traditional. And then I've got soft mounting, which on these beta FPV boards are real nice because you can just poke that soft mounting right through there. So I've got soft mounting all around the board and I've got nylon nuts locking the board down in front and in back. So let's tin up this ESC over here that I haven't done yet. I'm going to zoom the camera in so you get a little bit better view. Hopefully I'll still be able to see. If you are a first time builder, I always recommend putting a little bit of flux on there. Uh, usually, usually I use a flux pen. I'm currently out. Um, with experience, you can do this without flux and you'll get reliable results. I've built many quads. 50% of the time I use flux because I remember to and 50% I don't because I either don't have it or I forget. But let's go ahead and tin this up. I try to hold the soldering iron relatively flat. I'm using a very pointed um, iron here. So I want to get some heat on that pad. And I want to bring the solder to it. That's not enough, so let's do it again. That should do it. Add a little bit more. I don't want to spend a lot of time on the board generating a lot of heat. You want to get in and out relatively quickly. Now let's solder up this motor. This might be the most difficult part for me because of this camera and everything I got going here. But you can loop around and come from this side or you can go straight to it. I prefer to go straight to it just because it makes it a little bit easier to get that down. There's one. Oop, that one wasn't very good. Didn't get it hot enough. That's a little better. Not an expert, but uh, it does work. I have built... Geez, over the course of four years, I don't know how many micros I've built. My old eyes are getting to the phase where I might not be able to do it a whole lot longer. Let's go ahead and connect our receiver up so you can see that done. Let's see, rotate up here. This might be a little bit more cumbersome. I'm going to run this around. So I have to, I'm going to do my S bus or no, I'm going to do my uh, 5 volt and ground first and I'll do my S bus last. But I'm going to cross that underneath here. So I need my ground, I believe, is the lowest pad. Yes, that is correct. You can build one of these relatively quickly after you've done it a few times. I'm sure Adam Baum can build a quad in about 25 minutes, it seems like. He's built so many. And he's built several for me. My build time is relatively low. I'm doing this build because it's been requested many, many times that I do a build. If you're wondering, these is the TS-80. The TS-100 is also a very good soldering iron. I think I'm getting my hand in the way. Hopefully you can still see this. Let me uh, change my hand position a little bit. So I give these little wires a slight tug. Doing it with a needle nose so that you can see. Just want to make sure that... Things are relatively securely connected. No flimsy soldering joints. This one it looks like I might be touching this pad over here, which probably wouldn't cause me any harm, but I'm going to redo it just in case. See how I cleaned that up a little bit just by running my iron over it? Just let the, the solder that was kind of loose get up. Oh, that's not going well. There we go. So now we can have some obvious separation there. If you couldn't see that on camera, I apologize. So we've got our receiver connected. We've got one motor done. Now when I come back, I'm going to have the camera connected and the rest of the motors. At this phase, the soldering, the hard work, is kind of done. Now we do the software work and the final mounting of the camera. Maybe add some foam tape under here. We, I like to make sure everything's working before I get into the software side. Uh, the first thing you should know is I skipped kind of over this. Unfortunately, the label on my solder is gone. 
This is 6337 solder. I believe that's what's recommended. Uh, there's really nothing on here. I get it from Amazon all the time. I'll have a link down in the video description if you would like to use the same solder. It's real small solder, and of course for building micro, small solder makes sense. This is also a tool that I use quite a bit to hold those little wires, and when I can't get a good enough grip with this, I think there are better ones that actually spring close, like so you squeeze them to open them, and then when you release them, they close on the wire. I would prefer those, but I've never bothered to acquire because I've just made this work or I use a pair of needle nose, you know, just generic needle nose that you can pick up from your local hardware store. Also, when it comes to holding stuff in place, whether it to be your tenure boards, your motor wires, or stuff like that, I tend to use this stuff. It's called Blue Tack. It's actually kind of gray, um, but you know, it's very pliable. I've been using the same ball for probably over a year, and this is the package that it comes in. Blue Tack by Bostic. Uh, this I also bought from Amazon, but it's probably been maybe two years and in this package uh, you get these sticks that are in here and you can see I've got a fair bit left over here and I haven't used all that much so one package of this will go an awful long way in your builds one time I did run into a case where I apparently had some metal shavings or some solder that had gotten in my uh, blue tack and I was tinning up a, it was either an ESC or a flight controller and when I had it sitting on this uh, it wouldn't boot up. So I had shorted something. Thankfully, I don't recall damaging that component when I had it sitting on here, but it kind of mystified me as to what was going on because when I pull it off, everything would be fine. I'd put it back on the blue tack and then it wouldn't boot up so I couldn't get into beta flight. So as I said, I don't tend to mount everything up until I'm sure it's working. And the first stage to seeing whether it's working, whether you haven't done anything to cause any damage. One, I like to secure the camera. So I take a little bit of this blue tack and I stick it to the bottom of my camera to isolate it from the board, and I just stick it anywhere. So that's protected. If you don't have your um, receiver heat shrink coated like I do, you might want to do the same with that just to make it sure it's not shorting with anything. This one should be fine. I believe it's covered for the most part, at least enough to where I can just kind of push it out that way. Also, you should have a meter. Um, this is just one that I've used again. I bought a cheap one from a local hardware store. Um, the thing I like about this particular meter is admit it's a tone. You can see that's the tone selector. So when you're doing a continuity test, which you should do at this stage before you plug in a battery, even if you have a smoke top stopper, I always like to do a continuity test to make sure I don't have anything going on and we'll do that now. So I've got a meter over here so you can see and possibly hear. I'll be quiet so you can hear the tones. Um, so I'm gonna put this down in here and I kind of have to hold it against the ground side to make sure it doesn't touch the positive side. So that's what you see this hand doing kind of out of screen here is making sure my grounding stays. So the first thing I do is test the other pad. Nothing here, but I test to make sure my meter works. So I'm getting tone on the ground, not on the voltage. Come around here, test ground again, test voltage. Nothing. I can even come around here, test ground. That's normal. Oops, touch that little bit of solder. Oop, touch it again. I got a little point hanging out there. So here I'm on the 5 volt pad and I'm not getting anything. Uh, you could actually test ground down here too. And then 5 volt right next to it. We're not using those pads. That should give us some assurance that we won't get any mag magic smoke and short anything out. It's the first test. I also like to use a low voltage um, it's not really a smoke stopper, but it's this thing from RDQ on my first battery plug-in. This has actually saved me a time or two when I have maybe not done a thorough enough job with my meter. This will tend to save me as well. Uh, I think this is like three, four dollars. This lights up when you plug a battery in. So this is the phase where I'm going to plug the battery in and we hope that we don't get any magic smoke. We're also going to look for lights on the board, lights on our camera, and lights on our uh, receiver so we can make sure we got everything connected properly. Okay, you can hear we got tones, we've got lights on our camera, lights on our board, we've got lights on our receiver. It all looks good, so we should be safe. Next part, still before I'm going to mount everything up, is going to be connecting to Betaflight and making sure I have the smart audio for the camera set up properly and I'm bound with receiver. So also with the binding with the receiver, something that I do, again the blue tack, is I stick this little thing down. 
and then I hold my button on my receiver down and then I plug it in. Uh, let me go ahead and get my radio. So real quick here, you see I've got a D16 profile set up. I've basically just got two profiles set up, a D16 and a D8. You can bind multiple receivers under each setting, but setting up your radio for all the switches in use, that's not what this video is for. There's probably a hundred different videos on setting up the mixers in order to be able to use your switches for use on your quad. Uh, but I just go into the configuration and then I go to the binding. You can see I've got the fail safe set to no pulses. So I go over to bind and I'll set that to the side here. I am going to hold the button. Oh, my camera's moving around. I'm going to hold the button, which is right down here in the lower left of your screen. Make sure my camera is focused. So this is the part that gets, especially in micros, gets me kind of a pain. So I'm going to hold the button and I'm going to plug my power in. See how we've got that green light now on our receiver. Hopefully it comes through the green, this LED on this side. I can let go of the button. It's set for bind. Now this is the time where I hit the bind and I have to move my radio. Typically I have to move it a little bit away. Uh, arm's length is usually fine. You can hear my radio beeping. You can see the red light on my Effort Sky XSR flashing, indicating that they're synced up. Now when I unplug and I replug, I move my radio away. We get the one green light on here indicating, hey, everything is bound up, so we're all set to go. The next phase would be to connect it to Betaflight and do our configuration through Betaflight, you know, setting your rates, setting up the configuration for D-Shot, um, tones using D-Shot, all of those various things, making sure our, re our receiver is connected to our radio and we get stick movements in Betaflight, and we'll do those things next up on the PC. It just dawned on me that I didn't really cover how I connected the camera. Sorry about that. So this is our sheet that comes with the camera. Not all cameras come with this sheet. It's, it's pretty standard. Uh, the color coding here might be a little bit different from camera to camera if you don't have this one, but red is usually voltage. You can see it takes 3.3 to 5.5 volts and then we've got our ground our green wire goes to smart audio which is our tx1 our video out which goes to vout or vo on these little boards oftentimes it just says vo is where the yellow wire goes and in this case the blue wire is video in so it goes to vi or ven and as you can see here on the board as i get it to focus i've got all those connected up just so now we're ready to go ahead and connect to Betaflight and start to configure this little guy. Okay, in this section, we've done all the hard work of making sure everything's soldered up real nice. Let me just kind of set some things in place temporarily here so that we can do a little bit of work. I'll screw these things down and foam tape them and do all the things we need to do. I've got my radio out. There's a heavy glare off of that because of my overhead light. I apologize, you can't see that. At this point, you want to have your radio set up and you want to have all your modes or your switches set up for use. That's not what this video is for, so you'll be needing to look up other videos in order to do that. But the first thing I like to do is, if we haven't done it already in this video, because I've shot the other parts here days ago, plug it in, make sure I've got video, and listen to the radio talk to us and confirm that I have video. So my camera does function just fine, and I want to go into beta flight here. I'm going to show you how I set things up typically. Oh, I don't have the USB port, so let me plug that in real quick. Rookie mistake, right? I move my radio a little further away for the moment so it's not barking at us the entire time. Turn my screen off. Okay, so now I've got the USB port. We've got COM11 there. We've got our ports. We know that we're, our receiver is very likely on UART2 to check that. We go into the receiver and you can see we've got sticks. So I'm going to move my sticks around and make sure everything works as normally. Okay, sticks are working just fine. Let's uh, confirm that one of the things that you'll find that's a little bit different about mine than the defaults is the low stick threshold because you can see my throttle value goes down to 390, 393 that I want full resolution. So I go 1000 and 2000. So let's make sure that I've got my full range, even though it goes beyond 2000 on my radio, that's the way I tend to set them up. So if you've changed anything, or if you find by f when you log in or you look at Betaflight that your sticks aren't in the right position, see how this model is freaking out down here? And so throttle is now on roll. Well, that's not right. So you need to know what mode your radio is set up in. I know that mine is TAER. 
So when I do that, everything uh, everything sets up nicely. Uh, also, my switches, when I move them, this is my arm switch down here. So this will be aux one. This is my mode switch for flight. Telemetry Sorry, you couldn't lost. see that. This is the one I use for my flight modes. And this one over here is what I use for turtle mode and beeper. So those are all functioning. And as you can see, I've already got a few things set up on the modes tab. So let's go take a look. So my arm is switch one, which I showed you previously. And so if I go all the way up, then it won't show you yellow over here because I have USB plugged in. That's beta flight. It's doing its job. Uh, it used to not always be that way. And so there used to be a lot more accidents uh, for angle mode. I use that for, geez, this is getting annoying, isn't it? I'm, I'm going to move the quad a little bit out of shot. And uh, so I'll go into angle mode if my video goes out and then give a little bit of throttle or I'll just hold steady if I'm cruising to see if the video clears up. If it doesn't, then I disarm, go pick it up, find it, what have you. Uh, the beeper over here, I use that in the middle mode. You can hear that that's already set up because of D-Shot's presence. And then if we scroll down, 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 you'll see I have turtle mode or flip Delivery over after lost. crash. That is set up to be in the top Delivery position. Recovered. And that goes into its function. I do need to set up air mode. So I'm going to set up air mode. I'm going to put that on aux 2, which is this switch right here. When it's in the middle, air mode is on and we are in full acro. Your needs for how you might want to set up these switches could overlap. You might have angle mode and air mode on at the same time, or you might be using horizon and air mode. So this is very pilot specific. Let me go up here and I'll check this box so you can see how I have mine set up. So if you wanted to fly in angle mode um, with air mode, then you'd want to extend this all the way down. That puts you in angle mode or that, sorry, I had beeper there. Air mode. There we go. Now I got it. So when you put this switch into aux 2, you'd be in air mode as well as angle mode. I don't set mine up that way. I fly in acro or rate mode, whatever you want to call it. Telemetry recovered. Let's go Telemetry down to OSD. Telemetry recovered. Boy, that's getting annoying with the whole amber sound pack. Should have quieted that down. So here is, this is very custom. This is what you will want to do. Uh, how you want to set this up is very dependent upon uh, your own personal preference. Um, so I'm just going to tick the boxes I want to have on. And if you've seen any of my other videos, you know that these things tend to be in the same place all the time. I also don't tend to mess with the post flight statistics very much. Max speed, that's worthless. I'm not using anything GPS, minimum RSI, max current. You can leave these things on or off. It's really up to you. Um, I don't like the crosshairs. I find that very distracting. So let's put RSI in the top right. Let's move this kind of just out of the generic way here. Let's put our throttle position up top left. And you'll have to move these around depending upon how things are displayed in your goggles. So you want to have your goggles handy in order to decide where you're going to put them. So I'm going to scoot this one over and for our current. And then we're going to come on, scoot over a little bit. I want those away from the timer. So this is a general setting that I kind of use for all my quads. Sorry, I didn't have anything in the desk cam on. We still got our, our splinter down here. And it always shows stability down there, so don't worry about that. Um, next thing would be the font. If you have a font that you want to uh, change it to, I like to use Vision. It gives you a sample of what that's like. Now, when you do this, your screen, if you're looking at it, it will not display any of the OSD elements while you're updating the font. And it's best advised to have a battery plugged in because I have seen it where if you don't have a battery plugged in, the font won't update. And now it reboots. And so our font is now changed a little bit. So that's the OSD setup. Of course, there are many elements in there depending upon what your flight controller supports that you may or may not want. Uh, the PID tuning, I think I skipped over that. Let me disconnect or reconnect. This happens sometimes with my PC in beta flight. It doesn't always care for me. A little Facebook message popped up there if you saw that. Uh, back to PID tuning. I already have my rates in here. So my RC rate uh, for pitch and roll and yaw and then my super rate. Super rate is at the end of the stick. So in the last little bit of the stick, this will make it bark again. But when you get over here to the edges, that's where your super rate kicks in. That's so something that you can uh, play with. Now, I've been flying a while, so I kind of know what I'm looking for, what I want. 
because my rates are different for yaw, uh, I don't tend to use as much yaw because I have more of a racing style. So my nose is down. I don't. I need more yaw than I do roll. Or actually, I need more roll than I do yaw. If you were to be someone who does a lot of flips and flops, uh, you probably want those rates to be a little bit more even. So your memory for your stick movements is equal amounts on both sticks. I've also decreased these PIDs for tuning purposes. Uh, we don't have a problem where we yaw to the moon anymore, so that's not much of an issue. I'm going to go ahead and unplug the battery right now so this VTX doesn't overheat and burn up here on the bench and turn off my screen as well. And my radio should stop barking at us if you've been listening to that the whole time. So this is um, feed forward. I tend to do 60. I'll go ahead and try it here on 71 and 75. Feed forward is just how you make it more responsive. So once you've got your pit tune kind of settled in, as far as prop wash and handling goes, you may use feed forward to get more response, a quicker response out of the machine. Let's jump down to motors. Now that I've allowed the VTX to cool a little bit, and we're going to test our motor direction. This is a big deal. So depending upon what you've selected in the configuration tab, I've got it selected for reversed props. So the props will spin in towards the sides with the high side of the prop coming in here and in here. So traditionally they spin in towards the nose and in towards the rear with the high side of the prop leading the way. I'm not doing that on this one. I tend to do reversed motors uh, for two reasons. Um, because our profile is very, very low, our camera is kind of exposed. We don't have a lot of protection or the protection we have is plastic. So if I go into a branch or a tree, I'm hopeful that having reverse props will kick the machine a different direction and not just center the branch, the pole, whatever gets this way towards the prop into the camera. It won't allow that. Sometimes reversing your prop direction, your motor direction will help with handling in certain scenarios. It doesn't always work. Um, again, if you like how that feels, there's no problem with using it. Flying is flying, and it should always be fun. So when I go in to test my motors, and you can do this also in BL Heli, I just tend to start with um, beta flight because that's kind of how I make things. We're looking for the motors to rotate this way in towards the sides. So I'll just touch my finger on it in order to check that. So we'll go down to the motors tab. We've got to plug back in. I also have to be aware of my USB cable rubbing on this motor, so I may have to kind of get my hands over here while I'm sliding things around because I don't want to burn out an ESC just testing motor direction. So the first thing you want to do is you just want to make sure motor 1, motor 2, motor 3, and motor 4 respond when you're uh, turning up these individual sliders. So I've got motor 1, motor 1 is coming up, motor 2, motor 3, and motor 4. The only reason you check that because if you have your board upside down, your motor mapping may have to be redone. I've got a really old video on that if you need to use that. Uh, so let's go ahead and I'm just going to check all the motors at once, turn them up ever so slightly. So this one I can feel is kind of pushing my finger this way. And this one is. So these two motors are fine. They're, they're running this way and this way. Oh, this, one, this one's wrong. Motor 3 needs to be changed. And motor four is also rotating in towards the front. So double check this one and this one. Three and four need to be reversed. So I'm going to disconnect from beta flight and bring up BL Heli. I'm going to connect. I'm going to read the setup. So motors three and four. Whoops, I clicked the wrong thing. Sorry there. So motor three, I'm going to reverse that and I'm going to write it. Does it wrote it okay? And I'm right-clicking on the mouse in order to select the individual ESC. I'm going to reverse that. I'm going to write it. And so to just show you that the motors can be tested in BL Heli, we're here. So let's go ahead and test. Motors are all spinning. Motor 3 is now fine. Motor 4. And then just double-check. Motor 2 and 1. So everything seems to be right. And that is our beta flight and our ESC setup for motor direction. You can go in here and tinker with things. I don't suggest doing that unless you know what you're doing or if you're needing to solve a problem. That's where you want to just start to play with maybe your startup power. Um, and if you have 32-bit uh, ESCs, this interface is different and you have a different application to download. But I'll put links to the BL Heli Suite, the one that's not for 32-bit uh, as well as Betaflight. I'm actually using an older version of Betaflight because all the different machines that I am 
that I do have. So if you're using Betaflight 4.1 or in the 4 series, you probably want to run the different configurator. I have a lot of machines still on 3.5 something, so I have the older version of Betaflight. Yet another cam here. You get all the cams in this one video. So here we are fully assembled. You see I got my props on. I'm using these Gemfan Hurricanes. These are the 3018 props. You can get in a package just like that. They're press-on props. They're made specifically for motors with the 2mm motor shaft like Bob's FPT Cycle Motors here. These are the 1204 or 5000 kV motors. And you see that overlap that I'm talking about right here? That's why I wanted to keep my wires low, but then if you rotate, you see I got all sorts of clearance because I'm using 1204 motors. If you're using motors that aren't as tall, uh, that's something I wanted you to be aware of. I like a super low profile. It probably means I'm going to get a fair bit of prop in view, but the reason why I like a low profile, because if you come in and you hit something like this and your profile is lower, the chances that it will survive is greater. Uh, the taller your stack is, the more leverage anything that might hit you here or here wherever the impact is up top the further away it is from your base the more leverage there is and therefore the more damage it can possibly take so if you don't like props in view you probably have to do something different uh, a frame like this might not even be in store for you if you don't like props in view, you probably want something with a camera mounted up and forward uh, maybe a specially printed 3d canopy like we saw on the sail fly but uh, so I short my wires. I changed out my heat shrink. Hopefully you can see that right here. I changed out my heat shrink so I have those wires kind of circled up in there to make them nice and tight and short. I've got my little piece of foam tape on this side. I have the backing still on the double sided foam tape and I squirreled it away just a little bit underneath there. Uh, putting this canopy on, it's kind of a pain in the bottom because you've got to hold the nut with a pair of pliers. You've got to screw the screw and you've got to press down with the canopy all kind of at the same time. It's very doable. Didn't take me very long, but I can see why you wouldn't want to do that. Uh, this, these canopies are made to be screwed down like that because otherwise they're very, very tight and it's very hard to just press them down to the screw. You could use a nut on the top if you choose to to give it some extra security. But if I have anything hitting that hard up here, I'd rather it strip out the uh, canopy holes than to put additional pressure on my camera up top. But that's really it. Uh, I, I Like I said, I secured the battery lead down and the reason why I went this way and not this way is because my battery will be here sideways. So the battery leads will come out on this side and then I'll bring this back around and they'll plug in like this and that will keep the battery from flopping around too much. If I were to have a long battery, I probably would have brought this out underneath and then looped it back this way so I had my battery leads coming out front and then I would have had this back through here and then connected it that way. I just like to keep things kind of tight. Um, but yet still usable. You know, you get it too tight and the usability goes down. Uh, you can see my rubber band. I do, the one final thing I need to do that I haven't yet is I need to kind of just pull this rubber band out and then add my little gummy pad right there for holding my battery just a little bit better. But you also get a good look at how I did the antennas. I like to get a little bit of my heat shrink on the thicker part of the antenna wires. You can see a little bit of black underneath there on both sides, more so on this side than on this side. But I got a little bit, that just gives me a little bit of peace of mind that is going to hold those wires in place. I don't hunker these down hard, hard. I just make them taut. No whole can. So let's get the scale out and see what it weighs. All right, so our splinter, as I have it built, comes in at 55.3 grams. Pretty dang light. I probably have a battery. I don't know if I'll run 2 or 3S on this. I'll tinker with both. I would think that I get under a 100 gram marker, which would be kind of nice for something this size, but we'll see how it performs in an upcoming video. Hopefully you found that video at least somewhat informative or, or at the very least entertaining. And coming up in phase two, of course, will be the tuning and the flight. I probably won't step through the tuning process because that can vary widely depending upon if you're running in beta flight 3.5 something or if you're running beta flight 4 dot something. Um, Bardwell released a video here, I think it was a week ago, suggesting that 4.1 is awful, awful good for micros, so I may be giving that a whirl if we get some good weather outside. If you have any comments, questions, suggestions, or otherwise, please let me know in that section down below. I appreciate your time, and thanks for watching.